This video was brought to you by my loyal patrons. Pledge today and you can participate in choosing what video comes to the channel next. Link in the description. Dear Christopher, Here is your friend Thomas the Tank Engine. He wanted to come out of his station yard and see the world. These stories tell you how he did it. What makes a good sequel? Well, in movie terms, what a good sequel should do is take the settings and characters present in the first movie and tell a new story with them, while also continuing the story already established. A good sequel plays with new tones, new themes, and puts the characters through new trials. A good sequel ultimately shows growth from the previous, raises the stakes a bit, and most importantly, feels necessary. Season 1 of Thomas the Tank Engine, for what it was, was a perfect start to the series. It overall was a rather linear story, with a solid start and a conclusive end, with a minimalist cast of characters. You can watch all of Season 1 in one go and feel satisfied by the end of it. It tells a complete story. Season 2 takes these characters and settings and expands on them. More characters, character arcs of both existing and new faces, more of the island of Sodor we haven't seen before, it introduces some new mature themes and a slightly darker tone that the cheerful Season 1 didn't play with. Ladies and gentlemen, Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, Season 2. After the warm reception of Season 1 and its home run success in video sales, it was very quickly another season of Thomas was greenlit. Production on the second season started in early 1985, a few months after Season 1 had finished airing. Season 2 continued the same production team through Clearwater Features, David Mitten returning as director, Robert Cardona returning as producer, and Mike and Jr. returning as composers. Even Ringo Starr came back again as the show's narrator. Everyone involved with Season 1 made a return to this season. From a production standpoint, everything was pretty much the same, with only one big change. Where it was filmed. Season 2 was the first season to be filmed at Shepperton Studios in England, where the remainder of the show would be filmed from then on. This new season presented a unique challenge. What stories would they adapt this time around? Season 1 very linearly followed the outline of the Railway Series books, covering the stories of the first eight books in order, while combining some here and there. They could have just picked up right where they left off, starting with Edward's book, and doing everything after it. The issue was, some of the books in that lineup would be impossible to adapt due to the limitations of the model sets. For example, they couldn't do the Scarloe books because they hadn't figured out how to do Narrow Gauge yet. They couldn't do stories that featured weird one-off foreign engines because the budget wouldn't allow them to build new characters that would appear in only a single scene. But the biggest issue of all was that the next few books had shockingly very little Thomas in them. Show creator Brett Allcroft made the decision to focus the show around the character of Thomas, instead of having it be an ensemble series like the books. While from a marketing standpoint, this was a great idea, we'll now start to see some of the drawbacks of that. They had a contract in place that all episodes in the show had to be based on existing Audrey written print material. The show was not allowed to write its own stories at this time. Well, they used up most of the Thomas-centric stories in the books in Season 1, leaving very few left, so they were pretty stripped for Thomas-centric content. A brand new Thomas season with little episodes focused on Thomas himself just wouldn't fly. By 1986 though, Chris Audrey, the son of Wilbert Audrey, had rebooted the book series. So Britt Allcroft and co commissioned him to write a new book solely about Thomas so they'd have a selection of Thomas-centric stories to use for the show. The book, called More About Thomas the Tank Engine, the most imaginative title ever, released in 1986 only two days before Season 2 aired. Talk about cutting it close. Three of the four stories in the book became episodes. Thomas, Percy, and the Cole, The Runaway, and Better Late Than Never. Weirdly, the final story, Drip Tank, was dropped for unknown reasons. My assumption is because Season 2 was already very Percy-heavy, and they didn't want another Percy story in the lineup. 
but I'll get more into that in a bit. Some other stories came from different sources that were not present in the books. One episode, Thomas and Trevor, was taken from a one-off story written by Chris Audrey that would later become a story in an annual. Technically, it was not Railway Series, but it was written by an Audrey, so it was fair play. The finale episode, Thomas and the Missing Christmas Tree, was again based on a one-off book written specifically to tie into the TV show, not a main series one. Unlike season one, which was a linear telling of the stories in the first eight books in order, season two became a compilation of stories randomly plucked out of the books. All of the Edward book stories, most of the Percy book stories, most of the Duck and Diesel book stories, some of Branch Line Engines, some of Mainline Engines, the first two stories of Tramway Engines, some stories pulled from a book written specifically for TV, a random annual story, and another one-off Christmas story to finish the season off. Seems like a total mess compared to how straight edge and linear season one was. But somehow, they made it work. Cleverly creating a loose, top-level narrative in which everything feels connected. Season 2 was also the year of cancelled episodes. Several stories from the books were considered for this year, including Percy's Promise, Double Header, and Gordon Goes Foreign. None of these made it to the filming stage. However, the most famous cancelled episode was The Missing Coach, aka the first story of the Donald and Douglas plot arc, which was nearly complete when Britt cancelled it towards the end of filming. Her reason being the story had very little action and was too confusing. Which honestly, I totally get. That story in particular is a total mess, involving a plot where Donald and Douglas switch their tenders to confuse their identities. The episode is very unique for the series though, as it got far enough in production to actually have the majority of it filmed. Photos of the completed scenes have surfaced online, and many fans have attempted to reconstruct the episode with the sources available. There has been much speculation of what episode replaced the missing coach in the lineup, I believe the current consensus is that Better Late Than Ever was the replacement episode, but until a crew member steps forward to confirm that, it's currently speculation. Production ended in 1986, and the season premiered on September 24th with the episode Thomas, Percy, and the Cole, almost two years since the season one finale. Season 2 has the reputation among fans of being the gritty season. Like, of the classic seasons, I'd say the general reputations are that Season 1 is the slower one, Season 3 is the adventurous one, Season 4 is the comfy one, Season 5 is the cinematic one, and Season 2 is the gritty one. And there's good reason for that. Season 2 was a lot more workmanlike than Season 1, both in its presentation, its set design, and how it was filmed. Allow me to explain. Let's first talk about the camera work. Going straight from season 1 to 2, the biggest new innovation of the show visually is how much they play with how they use the camera. There is so much more movement with it this year, with an abundance of panning and zooming and tracking shots. And when I say an abundance, I mean literally almost every single episode has an impressive moving camera shot, some have several. The only episode to not feature a moving shot in any regard is The Runaway. That's literally the only one I checked. In fact, let's count them. I think you all get the picture at this point. Season 2 loved moving the camera around. You won't get many shots like this in Season 2, where the camera has to be in this exact spot so the details added in the foreground are visible. Let's keep in mind that Season 1 was filmed in a small studio, 
in what was no bigger than an average household garage, and that would have played a big factor in the decision to keep the camera static for most of that season. They couldn't do impressive panning shots across the set because there wasn't much of a set to begin with. If the camera panned over a few inches, the set's edge would be revealed. They were more constrained with what they could actually do with the camera, and those limitations aided that season's aesthetic. Since season two was the first season filmed in an actual studio, with much more space and versatility to work with, they took full advantage of it with the camera work here. Season two wasn't concerned with creating beautiful static frames that looked like paintings. It was more interested in wowing the audience with impressive camera work and dynamic angles. It was more workmanlike, with more freedom. This was more or less a guerrilla style season, getting the shots needed as efficiently and quickly as possible. So instead of strategically placing details in the foregrounds of shots, now all the sets are grimy and messy with little details sprinkled everywhere. So no matter where you place the camera, you're seeing some sort of point of interest on the set. This new grit makes this world feel so much more lived in as a result. Sodor is slowly making the transition purely from a storybook world to a real world. I wouldn't say season two is beautiful in the same way season one is. Season two was more workmanlike, more energetic, more gritty. And that's not to say that those season one-esque storybook sets made to suit a specific camera shot are not a thing this season. We do get a nice handful of those, like this one of the ruined castle for instance, and they will continue to be staples for the rest of Mitten's tenure. Secondly, let's talk about the overall tone. Season 2 introduced to us that while the show's universe is a very comfy, joyous, and storybook-like one that these characters inhabited, there was also an underlying darkness and sophistication to it too, which really comes to surface in episodes like Pop Goes the Diesel, where Diesel flat out says diesels are the future of railways. We come to a yard and improve it. We are revolutionary or Edward's exploit, where the engines discuss Edward's eventual obsolescence. He should give up and be preserved before it's too late. Or Saved from Scrap, where the show, for the very first time ever, deals with the concept of death. My master says I'm old-fashioned. They're going to break me up next week. The tone of season two was subtly darker than what we had previously. It stepped its toes into that territory of those questions we prefer to not have the answers to. The reveal of dieselization and the concept of scrapping are both introduced this year, which both become major plot points for the rest of the show. Suddenly, Thomas the Tank Engine isn't just a happy storybook world. It's now a slightly realer world with actual real-life consequences. Times change, an engine's life can end, and they all at some point will be obsolete. Pretty heavy stuff. On a lighter note, let's talk about Ringo. Ringo Starr's performance is a lot more energetic this time around. You can tell he had a lot more fun this season, giving much more energy to his line deliveries. Suddenly he heard an extraordinary noise. Whee! <laughs> Diesel lost patience. <laughs> he roared. Gave a great heave. Trucks get forward. Oh, oh! They scream. We can't. We won't. Let me in. Let me in. I'll chuff and I'll puff and I'll break your door in. And even attempting, emphasis on attempting different accents. Dinner, not fast yourself, Thomas. We'll soon have you back on the rails. Lush sakes, Donald. It's Henry! Don't fetch yourself, Henry! To be fair, I don't think I could do a Scottish accent any better. <clears throat> don't worry yourself, Henry! Uh, you know, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm not even going to try to continue that. I think Ringo's more monotone performance matches the more laid-back atmosphere of Season 1. Season 2 is quite a bit more exciting, so this newfound energy he brings fits perfectly. Spot Dougie, would you? Take that! Oh, oh, oh! Something that I heavily praise each season of the classics is how each one explores new parts of the island of Sodor, constantly world building, and season two does not disappoint in that regard. Season one was very mainline and Thomas's branch line focused, 
which makes sense since the majority of the stories that year were either Thomas or Gordon focused. Season 2 is the Edwards branch line season, with a very heavy emphasis on everything in that part of the island. This year we saw a ton of Brendam Docks, Trevor's Orchard, the Clay Pits, etc. We also get to see some more places on Thomas's branch line that we missed out on last time, like the Farquhar Quarry that was only mentioned in Season 1, the big yard with the sheds in Tidmouth where the engines stay, and that ever picturesque water mill. Even the main line gets a little bit more built out, with the addition of the big yards where all the rolling stock is stored, and even a new station too. Season 2 was the year of darker elements, the year of Edward's branch line, the year of cancelled episodes, and also the year of crashes. Season 1 had four crashes, two of which were pretty violent. It's safe to say that they hadn't really figured out crashes yet in the first season, that and the fact the stories they adapted didn't really call for that many. But by season 2, they were going all out. The crashes occur very frequently, but in typical Mitten fashion, all are treated with an amount of dread and seriousness. They are not played off as jokes. So many things are just destroyed this year, from signal boxes, to houses, to barber shops, to farm carts, to brake vans, which weirdly happens twice. In the same way, Season 2 solidified that the steam versus diesel feud and the concept of scrapping will be main staples in the show moving forward, it also solidified that violent crashes were going to be a mainstay. Let's now get into the characters. We got a whole lot to cover here. When it comes to who got to do stuff this season, Percy is clearly the season's winner, with a grand total of eight lead roles. Thomas is in second with seven, and Edward is in third with six. Season two beefed up a lot of the characters that were sort of shafted in season one. This was the year of Edward and Percy, the two of the seven mains who got very little focus in season one. Even Bertie the Bus gets some beefing up with two major roles this time around. That's a lot for him. Thomas, as always, gets his fair share of time in the spotlight. And in every major Thomas appearance this season, he is a jerk. If we hurried across the viaduct, it might collapse. And then you'd have no passengers at all. What would you do then? Run my train on time for one thing. In fact, this is probably the jerkiest Thomas season of them all. He's at his worst here. Every time we see him, he has a bone to pick with someone about something. He's mad at Percy for making his paint dirty. He thinks Trevor is inferior to him. He's jealous of Duck for taking Annie and Clarabelle. He's upset about the big engines making him late. He gloats he's clever enough to drive himself. He's upset at Percy for having an accident and supposedly blocking the line. Percy's had an accident, cried Toby. Botheration! That means I'll be late. Thomas does not have a major character arc this season like he did in Season 1. He's more so a constant this time around. But he is consistent and in line with the truest form of his character, the pricky, cocky, bratty Thomas that we all know and love. Your ugly fizz is enough to frighten anyone. The other characters we saw a lot of last year take a step back from lead roles this season and are resorted mostly to group appearances. Henry, Gordon, and James, who all got so much focus in Season 1, take a major step back. They all appear frequently, but with little to do. James gets a single lead, Gordon gets two leads, both of which are shared with Edward, and Henry has no spotlight episode at all, and I believe only speaks in five episodes total. These three resound more to appearing more as a big group this season. There are multiple episodes where the big three band together. They get blocked out of the shed, they stand up to duck, they all talk smack about Edward, they try to think of ways to save Donald and Douglas from being split up. Disgraceful, disgusting, despicable, finished Henry. In terms of characters who have big arcs this season, Percy is one of the most noteworthy. Percy was honestly kind of nothing in season one. You understood he was a cheeky little scamp, but that was kind of it. This year, we get to know quite a bit more. He retains his cheeky, mischievous spirit from last season, Though we also learn he is rather naive and prone to getting taken advantage of by the bigger characters. Percy's arc this year was learning to stand up for himself, whether that being standing up to the big engines with Duck, 
taking a stand against Harold the helicopter, or plotting ways to pay Thomas out. He even got a major status quo change, permanently moving out of the big yard and becoming a mainstay on Thomas's branch line. Of all the characters this year, Percy is definitely the one who is in the most different place at the end than where he started. Speaking of starts, the season's opener, Thomas, Percy, and the Cole solidified that Thomas and Percy are best frenemies, and sets course for them being the show's main duo moving forward. This is an interesting development, considering the main pairing in Season 1 was Thomas and Gordon. The show seemed to very quickly ditch that duo being the main one for the series, and it makes me wonder if this was the reason they decided to have the seemingly out of order Thomas, Percy, and the Cole as the premiere episode. It was like the show's way of saying, Thomas is back, baby! And Percy is now one of THE main characters. Thomas and Percy are the show's two mains from here on out. Huh. Steam vs. Diesels, Scrapping, Violent Crashes, and the Thomas and Percy duo. Season 2 really set up a lot of staples for the show, a lot more than I realized. There were several new characters introduced this year, and all of them have their own little individual arcs. I'm not going to go over all of them, but there are a couple I do want to quickly mention. Duck is probably the biggest of all the newbies this year, and he is a noteworthy standout because of his involvement in the Diesel plot arc, which is the heaviest of the season in my opinion. Duck is an interesting new character, being the show's third big station pilot engine, but very different to the previous ones. Thomas and Percy were both very cheeky to the big engines and prone to getting taken advantage of, while Duck is someone who is able to stand on his own ground and isn't afraid to talk back. Shut up! You're all jealous! The phenomenon of dieselization was a big topic this year, so naturally we were introduced to several diesel characters. Diesel, as the first diesel in the series, of course posed a threat to the steam engines, who were all too ignorant in this intro episode to fully realize that. After Diesel's departure, the audience is left with a gross taste in their mouths for diesels. They are the bad guys of the show moving forward. That's why I appreciate this season also introduced Boko, who is the antithesis for the Diesel argument. This is where I find Season 2 very clever for how it weaved its seemingly random bunch of stories together. Having Diesel and Boko introduced in the same season worked a treat. Diesel represents the worst of Diesels, while Boko represents that not all Diesels are bad. He's an easygoing, humorous guy, in a great contrast to the slimy types like Diesel. And we also got Daisy introduced this year too, who stands somewhere in the middle. With the introduction of these three, by the end of the season, you know that some diesels are bad, and some are not so bad. I really like that. This is not a simple black and white world. There's much more nuance to it. When it comes to the MVP of the season, I think that award rightfully goes to... Edward. This is the heaviest Edward season ever. There are no other seasons that have this many Edward episodes. Edward's arc this season is a happy coincidence of the random stories they strung together for this lineup. It works because we have the Edward book stories at the beginning of the season that set up Edward is getting old and worn out. Edward was getting old. His bearings were worn and he clanked as he puffed along. Over the course of the season, we are reminded numerous times by characters that Edward is old and not very respected by them. Edward is impossible. He clanks about like a lot of old iron and he is so slow he makes us wait. Just pathetic. He should give up and be preserved before it's too late. People say I'm old-fashioned, but I don't care. And it all finally builds up to the grand finale with Edward's exploit. The big episode where Edward proves one final time he isn't a worthless old engine once and for all. Duck and Boko saw to it that Edward was left in peace. Gordon and James remained respectfully silent. This arc, paired with Edward's abundance of supporting roles and all the focus on his branch line, really made it seem like Edward was the show's main character this season. I think an argument can be made that Percy also deserves the MVP title, but I'm going to give it to Edward here because I have a feeling Percy may be getting that award a couple times in the seasons following. Season 2 had a crazy variety of stories. From lighthearted simple stories like Thomas and Trevor, to exciting tense ones that revolve around a chase sequence like Old Iron or a Close Shave, 
to more somber, melancholic ones like Dirty Work or Saved from Scrap. The season goes all over the place. I think this season's standout episode award rightfully goes to... Ghost Train. Ghost Train uniquely has a tone that the others don't. It is the first spooky episode of the show, taking place almost entirely at night, excessively using fog effects to set the mood, combined with a score that could make your heart stop. This was an episode that always stood out to me as a kid. It leaves quite an impact. There are no other episodes like it in this season. In my opinion, the episode that sums up Season 2, and this might be a bit of a bizarre choice, is Wrong Road. Wrong Road has all the elements Season 2 was known for. The Steam vs. Diesel feud, Edward presence, very impressive camera work, cool night shots, industrial sets, an atmospheric tone, etc. It's all here. Wrong Road has it all. It is very uniquely Season 2. I hate calling the worst episode of each season the worst one, because the connotation of worst implies it is bad. But that's not the case. There are no bad episodes in these first few seasons, in my opinion. But there are ones that are weaker than others. And my choice for the weakest of the lot this year goes to Better Late Than Never. I do like the episode, and I like that it follows up on Thomas and Bertie's rivalry in Season 1. It's time we had another race. I reckon I could beat you now. Nice continuity there. But in a season that is very plot-driven, where every story is a part of some multi-episode arc, this episode doesn't really relate to anything and just sort of wastes time. It exists just so Thomas could have another Spotlight episode this year. And that's really it. He was really fighting for the limelight this year with all the Percy and Edward focus. A shame that the Thomas Spotlight Hog Syndrome, something the later seasons are plagued with, had its roots this early in the series. I suppose this episode also feels like filler because it potentially is just that, considering it's the currently supposed replacement episode for The Missing Coach. So in that regard, its sort of nothingness pretty much adds up. It is just filler. That being said, it's not a bad episode, but it just feels very unimportant in a season full of plot arcs. The word I would use to describe Season 2 is innovative. Season 2 is innovative in a lot of ways, some ways I hadn't even realized until I started making this video. It was innovative in how much they experimented with the camera movements and built the sets to accompany that. It was innovative in how it cleverly wove together 26 seemingly randomly selected episodes and made a cohesive plot narrative out of them all. It was innovative in how it leveraged a newer, darker tone while keeping the light-hearted storybook feel that Thomas the Tank Engine is known for. And it was innovative in that it introduced so many new beloved staples for the series moving forward. Season 2 is not just more of what we got in Season 1. Season 2 is a continuation of Season 1, showing real growth in all aspects, from how it was filmed, to tone, to the characters. And really, that's what a good sequel should do. Season 2 complements the legend Season 1 started, and builds upon it. What on earth will they do next? Well, we'll just have to wait and see, won't we? I hope you all enjoyed this episode of the Thomas Retrospective. I sure did. I'm glad the first episode went over very well with people. This is a series I have really been enjoying putting together. The format of this is starting to take shape, so I'm excited to see how it'll evolve as we get into the later seasons. Now I'd like to take a moment here to promote a couple things. First of all, I'd like to bring some attention to one of the actual Thomas music composers himself, Mike O'Donnell who is an avid fan of my content and a really friendly guy. He is responsible for many of the classic themes in the original Thomas series. Mattel has no plans to release the show's soundtrack officially, so he's been working on recreations of all the old themes for the public so they never fall into obscurity. 
The music is available for purchase in a special bundle pack on his website, Mod Music. On the screen now is a discount code. If you wish to purchase the bundle, use this code at checkout and get 15% off. Link in the description. As Mike is one of the men responsible for creating the soundtrack that basically defined my childhood, I want to do what I can to help promote his stuff. I highly recommend checking it out. Also, once again, if you are interested, I do have a Patreon open now. If you choose to pledge, you will get special perks such as two-day early access to videos, you get to vote on what the next video topic is about, access to the PSD files for my video thumbnails, and you get your name in the credits of every new video, just like the ones you see on screen right now. Click the link in the description, take a read through the tier options, and pledge if you'd like. My Patreon has exploded over the last couple of weeks, and I really can't thank you all enough for your show of support. That really helps me out as a content creator, so I can continue to make the best content I can for you all at a consistent rate. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next one.